The return journey must have been brutal. The return of the Jedi? The return journey. Oh, the journey back. The right. journey back must have been brutal. <clears throat> I mean, it had taken them uh, three months to trudge over the ice and snow to their destination, only, of course, to realise they got there second. So, <laughs> of course, that, that would have sucked. But, um, but it was the weather afterwards that made it so much worse. So, so the ice and snow on the way there, not enough. Well, the ice and snow on the way there were okay. They were probably, I don't know, it, it got worse. Actually, it was summer. It was... <laughs> no, that's not summer. It was January, February, March, but unseasonably cold. In fact, it's mm -hmm. been recorded as one of, one of the worst summers on that continent ever. And they'd stuffed up a little bit in their planning. Um, they got a few details wrong. They'd taken the wrong animals, that kind of thing. <laughs> we only brought pets. Uh, they brought ponies. They brought my they, salamander they, and my they, parrot they, they for brought, companionship. <laughs> <laughs> they brought ponies when other people brought dogs. But um, oh. anyway, uh, they ran out of food and so they ate all of the ponies. Uh, then they ran out of ponies. They ran out of fuel and that meant that they couldn't defrost any ice to make water and the weather kept getting worse. Nice. So they turfed everything, everything that they didn't need to carry. They got rid of scientific equipment. They got rid of everything. Can't you eat that? Uh, it would be great if you could. Surely, I'm, I'm thinking this is olden times. Surely some of the scientific equipment was Micros made of leather. Ed edible microscope. Yeah, leather <laughs> microscope tubes. You can suck on them and make mouth soup. Guaranteed there would be multiple people in this story who would have survived a little bit longer if they had edible scientific equipment. Mm. So there's, there's a... Growth industry. They ran out of fuel, which meant that they could no longer boil water uh, to drink. Mm. And again, the weather keeps getting worse. Edgar Evans died on the 17th of February. Mm. The remaining four members of the party hunkered down in their tent hoping for something, hoping maybe that a team of dog sleds from the coast did might they, come up and get them. Did they eat Edward? Uh, they didn't eat Edward. I think Edward died with a knock on the head or something like that. So that's perfect. <laughs> uh, no one came to help. Uh, on the 16th of March, Lawrence Oates, quite famously suffering from frostbite, left the tent saying as he closed the flap, I'm just going outside and I may be some time. Yeah, that's the road. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, this is, this is very, very much the road. Uh, this left Edward Wilson, Henry Bowers and Captain Robert Falcon Scott confined to their tent by a blizzard just 11 miles short of their supply depot. And so Scott wrote his last diary entry on the 29th of March, 1912. We shall stick it out to the end, but we are getting weaker, of course, and the end cannot be far. It seems a pity, but I do not think I can write more. It's, I know. Yes, that's the tragedy. <laughs> he was a very, very british -y explorer. But... Damn it, I can't write anymore. <laughs> this life couldn't be any worse. <laughs> the winter was getting, winter came, and the tent was covered with snow. When summer rolled around again, another party of explorers, including the Norwegian Trygvi, Trygvi Gran. Flawless. Doesn't, doesn't matter about his name, but he, uh, they all set out to find Scott's body and Gran recorded it in his diary. The moment when it happened. It has happened. We have found what we have sought. Horrible, ugly fate. Only 11 miles from the one-ton depot. The owner, that's what he called Captain Scott. I don't know why he's called the owner. Owner. Wilson and Birdie. Doesn't really matter. All ghastly. I'll never forget it so long as I live. A horrible nightmare could not have shown more horror than this. The tent, he wrote, is snow-covered till up to the door with Scott in the middle, half out of his sleeping bag. The frost Which half? <laughs> I, no, okay, it's definitely got to be his head half is out. His head half is out. You don't think he's butt out and keeping his head warm? No, because this next bit d does describe it. Oh, okay. The frost had made their skin yellow and transparent, and I've never seen anything worse in my life. <laughs> the owner, that's Scott, seems to have struggled hard in the moment of death, mm. while the other two seem to have gone off in a kind of sleep. There is no more hope, so God look after our people. So the search party built a can and held a burial service. But there's one small detail, one small detail that Gran didn't record because wedged in the tiny tent was something heavy, 35 pounds of something heavy, mm -hmm. that Captain Scott had desperately hauled across the frozen continent even when they'd abandoned so much else.
Welcome to The Wholesome Show, very special edition, Earth Science Week edition. Coming to you from Earth. The Wholesome Show is me, Will Grant. And me, Dr. Roderick Griffin. I really want to know what way. 35 pounds, Lamberts. 35 pounds that they kept. And we are joined together by special guest from Geoscience Australia, Tanya Pajic. Tanya, hello. Hello. Thanks for having me over. Excellent, excellent to have you. So I'm, I'm just going to read a little bit of a bio for Tanya. Tanya has been brought along board by Geoscience Australia to check any dumb things that I say about she geoscience. She has a busy <laughs> night. <laughs> so she has a bachelor's degree in physics and geophysics, a master's degree in geophysics with a specialisation in seismology and processes of the Earth's interior mm-hmm. and a PhD in seismology. Damn. I mean, what a coincidence though. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome on board, Tanya. Almost like I'm here for the Earth Science Week. <laughs> oh, look, a, a, a little bit. So, so just tell us a little bit. What's, um, what sort of work do you do at Geoscience Australia now? I work at the National Earth Alert Centre as a science capability team lead there. So I'm sort of um, responsible for the quality of the products that that we put out to the Earthquake to GA webpage. Let's put it like that. That's a very short. This is really weird. Wait, wait, you make earthquakes? Yes, every day. <laughs> no, it's really weird no. because rarely for Australia mm. we are coming. I mean, maybe Australia decided to step up for Earth Science Week. Um, we had an earthquake. I mean, obviously Australia mm. never, ever, ever, ever has earthquakes. It's known to science that Australia is a non-earthquake zone, mm. but we had one recently. So is this, is this the bit that I, when I correct you? <laughs> you can definitely that do that. Is, <laughs> Not, not, not the case. Yeah, not the we case. we absolutely always, 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 daily, daily have earthquakes. Daily. Are we having one now? I don't know. Potentially, um, we can check in with the duty seismologists, but I, I really wouldn't bother them. They have important work to do, <laughs> and they should work. not be disturbed. <laughs> but not terribly. Is it not terribly big, or it's out somewhere where we don't notice? Or Australia's? Is there a reason we we don't talk about them much? Conspiracy? Quiet. Um, We're just shy. Probably the fact that a lot of people don't feel them. You know, a lot of Australia doesn't really have um, populated areas. So I guess that's part of the game. Mm. I assume it's the reason my dog is untrainable. Earthquakes? Because she can tell her earthquakes when I can't. And so I'm trying to make her pay attention to the, you know, the cues and the rewards and she ignores me. Always that. Earthquakes. (laughs) <laughs> so, so it's, it's they're not, like they're not sit- that common bro they're not that common <laughs> oh, that, this was going so well i think you just can't train your dog ah. that's all <laughs> oh so you have a phd in dog science too i mean will does all right 19th century paleontologists and bio- biologists they had a bit of a problem mm. you see They'd spent the best part of that century doing a whole bunch of great science. You know, they'd been dig- digging up dinosaur bones. They had uh, discovered and crafted a whole new idea about the ancient history of the world. They had discovered at the very beginning of that century extinction. They'd worked out, hang on, we actually lose some of these things. Well, you know, I heard about that only yeah. recently. I'm trying to yeah. remember where. And there was this guy with a big beard. He came up with a really awesome theory of natural selection. But Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. <laughs> No, oh, no. I'm out. I got no idea. Charles ideas. Darwin. Uh, but he, they, was, he was not in ZZ Top. He should have been. Sorry, back to your story. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm interrupting. You are a little, but anyway, it's all right. It's a, but but towards the end of the cent, uh, the 19th century, they started uh, discovering some anomalies. Uh, there was this guy. He's uh, he's called Mesosaurus, which means middle lizard. Uh, like basically your medium sized dinosaur. He looks a little bit like a sort of little crocodile. <laughs> About a metre long. Um, he lived 300 million years ago in the, the late Devonian, for those of you who uh, respect the ages of the dinosaurs. I was going to ask. Yeah. Um, he, he had webbed feet, uh, a streamlined body, and a long tail that may have supported a fin, which would look very cool. I, I think if a crocodile is swimming through the water and it's got a fin on the back. Easy to see, at least. That's not bad. Anyway, he was first discovered, he, she, it, uh, the, they, whole, the whole species. They, we use they. Yeah, okay. Uh, that dinosaur mm. was first discovered um, by Paul Gervais uh, in South America in 1864. All cool. They celebrated <laughs> that. That was very good. But then they discovered it again 25 years later uh, in South Africa mm. by George Goetz. 
So people yeah. are like, how did he get across there? I mean, it was a swimmer, but not enough to swim the Atlantic Ocean. The, the fin probably acted as a sail. <laughs> it might have done. Or another one. There's this guy. His name's uh, Listrosaurus, and he looks like a fat fossil dog. I, I'll just hold it up to the screen there. And No, that does not look like a dog. It's, it's a little... It looks fat. <laughs> It's a fat I'll give little, you that. It's a fat little dog dinosaur. That's, a, that's like a naked mole rat. Okay, sure, sure. In fact, I think that is a naked mole rat. Well, it's more dog-sized. Dog, Not in this picture. Okay. Uh, only had two teeth. Only had two teeth. Like it's a... Um, like a naked like mole tusks, rat. Like tusks. Like a naked mole. Yep. And, and a horned beak um, for eating things. It had a semi-sprawling gait. Um, Anyway, uh, it lived, uh, what have we got, 252 million years ago and was first found by Edward Drinker Cope in 1870 in South Africa. But then, not long later, they started finding it in Moscow and India and China. Finally, this one. Uh, I'm just going to... So I think someone's making a cocktail in the background, which sounds delicious. Oh, it's gone now. Uh, finally, there's this. This one is Glossopteris. Glossopteris, not a di- not a dinosaur. It's a plant, ancient plant, um, a woody seed bearing shrub. Maybe reaches thirty meters tall. Not a shrub, but damn, I don't know. Maybe don't in know. the olden days it was a shrub. First discovered, uh, uh, not discovered. Uh, it was lived two hundred ninety eight million years ago, um, but uh, was discovered all over South America and then Southern Africa, and then India and Australia and Antarctica. And again, again, there's huge oceans in the way. <laughs> Might just find that mute button there. I think, uh, Katie Burgess, if you'd be so kind as to mute your uh, microphone. I got you, there you go. Oh, you got it, okay. There you go. Thank you. So we got to this, they started discovering all of these anomalies all across, um, all across the world. And they're thinking, how is this, how is this even possible? And so, so the same thing's popping up all over the place and it doesn't make sense. Same dinosaurs cropping up in different continents. Right. you got a dinosaur in South America and a dinosaur in South Africa looking exactly the same. You've got a dinosaur in Moscow and a dinosaur in South Africa, but not finding it anywhere in between. And they're thinking, how the hell did this dinosaur oh, get between. from okay. South Africa to South America? Boat. People started wondering, well, maybe boat. One of the first people to wonder about was was this guy, and the only reason I, I included a picture of him is the most. He's is the most, beard? It's the beard. He's the most Victorian-looking gentleman that I have ever seen. It's, Jesus, that would have taken years too, because that's not thick. There's actually multiple photos where he definitely shaved it off after this. He definitely got sick of this. But that photo was taken. He was in between shaving it off and not finished. <laughs> that's not great. Uh, so this was uh, Charles Darwin's best buddy, mm-hmm. Joseph Hooker. Um, he, he said probably species were everywhere, but maybe climate change or something like that. They didn't really have an idea, idea of climate change, but he said climatic cause. Uh, must have split them up, but he didn't go much further. I just put him in because I like the picture of this guy. He's a great, great beard. But um, this other guy, Jules Marcou, um, a Swiss, French, American geologist, he got his pencil out. Okay. Yep. He got a pencil out and he started drawing maps of the world where he put land bridges all over the place. So sure, but I could do that. Like, I wonder how they got there. Oh no, I'll put a bridge in. Look, yeah. here's a picture. <laughs> this was the amount of science that he did. He just said, "All right, maybe." Okay, we we know that there, there are current land bridges. There's uh, North America, South America, go through Panama. Pl- yeah. Plenty of land bridge there. Yeah. Um, and there was land bridges that have disappeared. Um, Bering Strait between Alaska and uh, and America, Alaska and Russia. But he said, oh, but what about one going between South America and Africa or one about Africa and India? He drew them all over the place. He's got this great map. Of course he's great. <laughs> Again, I, I, I need more convincing because, you know, that sounds pretty easy. Mm. He said that over time they had they'd, they'd gone and collapsed. It would probably make more sense if he did it with a Sharpie. Look, right. That's true. That's a good call. Yeah, that is it's a power a, move. Yeah. It's a little bit Trumpian, isn't it? Just uh, here yeah, on the map. Just I've put just put a Sharpie just, on it. Yeah. In his defence, he went between the closest places. So he went for sort of like the edge of Brazil to the edge of Africa. He didn't draw really outlandish ro- long ones. But yeah, he's not an idiot. You've got to sneak people up on this. You've got to warm them up to the idea before you go insane. <laughs> he, gave, he gave them names. They were called Arch Atlantis from the West Indies to North Africa, Ooh. Arch Hellenis from Brazil to South Africa, uh, Archiborus in the North Atlantic. That one connected uh, England through to Greenland. So They're not connected? Uh, no, they're not. Oh, he, he, said, right. he said everywhere... All connected, connected them all up. 
Um, okay. And the thing is, you know, so we look at this and we go, okay, uh, I don't know, Tanya, how much Geoscience Australia uses the theory of land bridges anymore. Um, just between sub areas. We just don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but people loved it. People, people like every geologist, like, hmm, this is pretty legit. This is totally legit theory. Like well, this solves all our problems. It really did. It mm. said, okay, so maybe the animals walked and the trees, yeah. you know, went across slowly, seeds and stuff like that. But it solved all the problems, kept all the continents nice and still, as we'll discover in a bit. Um, With a bridge, mm. you know, in between. Yeah. There's San Francisco bridges all over the place. Right? Yes. I, that's how I imagine them. And weirdly. Decorative, I liked it. Uh, as I'll tell you in a bit, the, st- the story, that theory hung around for a lot longer than you'd think. You don't know what I think, but carry on. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh but I know how long it hang, hung, hung around for. Oh. It was a lot longer than you think, Rod. <laughs> <laughs> so um, some other scientists were a bit more creative, and um, I want to tell you the story of Roberto Mantovani. Um, he, he Mant- hadn't... He, Mantovani, Mantovani. Uh, an Italian guy. He, he was born in 1854 in Parma. Um, he was raised by his mother. His father died young. And then he, um, he was. So accept- what, what year was he born? Sorry, sorry. 18, 1854. 1854. 1854. Yeah, yeah. He was accepted into the Royal School of Music, and he took out honours in violin. But um, he said he always loved the exact sciences <coughs> way more than um, than music and literature. So he took to geology, which I, I love the idea of the guy running away from music school to take up geology. <laughs> Violin's the wrong kind of science for me. <laughs> but. Uh, he- his idea was that um, the uh, the continents <coughs> were all connected, uh, but in the in the ancient past, the continents were connected, but not in the way that you're thinking. Because his theory was that the Earth here you go. There's a picture of this. The Earth started much smaller than it is now and has been gradually expanding ever since. So his idea was that the Earth is... Oh, is, it was all joined and then it blew up. ...is one hard continent. And oh. and we've sort of expanded like uh, like you would a uh, um, dough or something like that. As, yeah. it's, as, as bread dough is cooking in the oven, mm. uh, the continents seal and expand around it. And so. then the liquid pours into the spaces? Uh, yes. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Okay. No one knows. Is again, <laughs> Tanya. Probably the Earth is cooling in in this scenario. So why would it be? You know, I, yeah, whatever. Well, we need to ask an, another. Imagine living. Imagine living in a time when this is actually accepted. Well, I, I look. I get most of my facts from members of the <laughs> string I'll, instruments. I'll, uh, you, you know. You know what, Tanya? There may be people in this in this <laughs> Zoom that may have lived in a time when it was widely accepted, and there may be people. You never know. It's. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a sip spoiler now. It's narrowly accepted still. There are people. There are. <laughs> there are people who worry about this. <laughs> they worry about it because yes. we're going to pop. Yeah. No. Because. I don't want to. Just going to go <laughs> around the solar system. I mean, the imagine if this keeps happening, the international flights are actually going to get longer and longer, right? That's so something to worry about. What's an international so flight? Like, yeah, I mean, that's, I that's I a good point. Yeah, I okay. forgot what they. Uh. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's weird, though, at, at the same time. So he thought thermal expansion, the Earth is just getting gradually bigger. Um, and it did. Many billions of years ago, yes, a little bit, but his theory was that sure. it's still growing and getting a little bit bigger, and the continents um, are just the p- hard pieces that were left over. Um, it's weird, though. Other geologists at the time thought the Earth was contracting, and that's why we had mountains. Um, well, it's bound to be both. We contract expanding. They didn't. They didn't. Uh, they didn't really worry too much. <laughs> I like that. We, we totally disagree on every basic premise. Yeah, don't worry about it. You, you start a different science here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't think they were really. It, it, tr- was, it was it was a bit like that. It was a bit like that. There was like a lot of stuff that they just ignored, like you know, in all these theories. There, there was, uh, you know, when someone would ask questions, "Hey, but what about?" and then they were like, "Yeah, don't, don't worry about it. Just sleep it under a rug." You're making okay. us we'll, work we'll after lunch. Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> yeah. It would be nice to get back to a science that says, "Yeah, don't worry about it a little bit." No, it wouldn't. <laughs> I'm working on it. All right, so I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you the origins of a theory that actually did attempt to answer some of the fossil questions. And That's how kind. The others also attempted to answer. They they attempted. So yeah. so so far we've got land bridges or expansion of the Earth. So 
there's another theory. And the theory goes back actually a really long way. So the first first map that we ever had of multiple continents mm. was, um, it was actually first drawn in Roman times, but it was lost for a thousand years. Um, and they redrew it in Florence in about 1477. Uh, and it's a map of Europe and Africa, and it goes over to India a little bit. It's a bit rough, um, sure. and, and around to Thailand. Uh, but it's a it's a really cool mm. map. I mean, it must have been mind blowing. So this was Ptolemy's Geographia, which is how they got it. It must be mind blowing when they first saw it to go, oh God, that's that's what the world looks like. So they lost it for a thousand years, and then someone said, "I've found it." Yeah, but I drew it myself. It, it wasn't it, the book. Is it's it, happy. It, with a shot. <laughs> the book was an instruction for how to draw a map. It wasn't actually the map, uh, and oh, so a word so picture of a map. It was a, it was a word picture. So so what, what is it like? Left a bit, right a bit, left a bit. <laughs> Only one hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> no. He would say he would say start at like a promontory, like a like a cape or something like that. Okay. And then you head um, north north by a little bit and and east by a little bit, and then you okay. then you'll reach a beach, and then you head. So it's kind yeah. of a computer program. Yeah. Step 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 step, and yeah. so it would okay. say how to do the coastline. And it's, it's just this long list of coordinates. Um, and some poor sod said, bugger it, I'm going to do it. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. in Florence, I suppose. So There's not a lot going on. It, it wasn't super accurate because it was basically, when he collected it, was, um, it was a list of how long it took to ride between different different uh, cities. Okay. So people would say, okay, that's four days ride, that's six days ride, that's two days ride, whatever. Um, and he sort of used all that, correlated, and came, yeah, out, came out pretty yeah. accurate. Okay. Um, but the list of instructions was in Roman times, uh, like the year 150. Uh, then it was lost. Uh, it came up in the Arabic world in like the year 900. Huh. Um, and then eventually it was translated to Greek in, in 1400 and, and then in Latin soon afterwards. Anyway, they said, they said, all right, let's see what it looks like. Let's, let's draw this out, which, which must have been, oh. I still think it must have been so mind blowing to go, you go from a list of instructions to an actual map of Europe. That like it's seriously, it's an early version of coding. Well, it, it wasn't quite because <laughs> if you think, if you think about it, um, the, actually, the Prime Meridian was agreed to about 300 years ago, maybe? To date, like in October, 300, like 18 something, I can't remember. So before then, yeah, you, you're right. Everyone was using this, oh, go left here and oh, yeah. right there right. and four days this way. And then there was like leagues, feet, oh, absolutely. miles, like all this other crap, right? So there, there were no coordinates per se. Yeah. Um, because no one could say what their north or east off. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, so it wasn't exactly the same map that that was going through. <laughs> but the thing, that, the thing okay. that um, the thing that I that I totally admire, and I get, I get, there's a lot of problems here, but um, you get a bunch of explorers. Christopher Columbus was was one of the first ones. He actually did a bit of critique of the map. He's like, well, you know, um, <laughs> I'm aboard. And, and he said, all right, I'm going to go and test. I, I want to go out and have a look. And so it wasn't. It was like, fuck, that's a committed critique, isn't it? <laughs> What happens at the end? But but he saw it like it was um, it was mass produced, somewhat in 1477, 1492. He's sailing off the edge of that map um, and journeying towards what they called the new world, which you know. Um, well, it was new to some. But here's the cool thing. So pretty soon after, you, you get the first maps of North America, South America. And Europe and Africa, all the way around, Australia was left off for quite some time. Jerks. But we get those first maps. Yeah. And there's a guy called Abraham Ortelius. He lived in Antwerp. Um, in, uh, he, was, he was born on the 4th or 14th of April, 1527. Our birthdays are so ambiguous. Labour took a lot longer back then too. He's famous because he made the, the world's first atlas. He combined a whole bunch of, of maps and said, this is my atlas of the world, obviously missing key bits, but nevertheless, he did a pretty good job. Someone had to start it. But this is the first time he did this. He looked at, he looked at the outline of North and South America and the outline of Africa and Europe, and he's like, you know, you know, <laughs> if you, if you kind of hold them up, it looks like they joined. So literally from the very like first... I, wait a minute. <laughs> no, it, was, it, just, it just blows my mind. Like as soon as we had maps, th this guy is, is holding them up and sort of doing the Mad Magazine thing of just you sort of oh, the squeeze yeah, yeah, it yeah. together. Yeah, yeah. And look, I make the continents kiss. That's just... So it was also the first pornography. Probably. Yeah. Okay. So here's his words. It's almost like America had been torn away from Europe and Africa by earthquakes and flood and that the vestiges of the rupture reveal themselves. If someone brings forward a map of the world and considers carefully the coasts of the three aforementioned parts, 
where they face each other. So he's, I drew, and this was based on these maps that were now verified by live observation, or they were still driven, uh, written by no, these this is, this instructions. Is much, this is much better. So this is um, live observation. So this is yeah. a lot of people on boats doing a lot of more cartography now, and they're taking much better maps. But right, the key right, right. thing, as soon as they got a map with North and South America and Europe, someone is saying, "Hang on, that they kind of fit together yeah. like a jigsaw puzzle." Yeah, it's weird. People didn't really talk about it very much but a whole sounds bunch sounds like geoscience australia from what uh, tanny described no and that's a bit awkward we don't talk about it yeah yeah no yeah. we don't talk about land bridges but we often talk about jigsaw puzzles oh that's all right okay yeah fair I'm enough. sure yeah yeah, yeah. So but it, it's weird important distinction that's true that's true it kept coming up over and over again so so he had this idea in 1564 mm -hmm. 1564 yeah um but you get like a german theology professor um theodore christoph lithaniel in 1756 he's like you know, if you fit them together, it kind of looks like they fit together. Um, but it had already been done, the jerk. No, but no one really, no one, pe no one paid attention. Oh, they didn't but, talk about but it. But there's a whole list of people. It wasn't, it wasn't really picked up. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no Alexander, no Alexander von Humboldt, um, Francis Bacon, the Comte de Buffon, uh, Francois Placet, Thomas Young, Richard Owen, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, Heinrich Wettstein, uh, Esmond Fisher, Charles B. Waring, a whole bunch of names over and over again. People all the time continually having this idea, and it's always kind of new to them. Like they've no one has heard yeah. this before, yeah. but it's new to them, and they go, you know, if you kind of if you kind of look at America and Africa, Europe, is it just me? <laughs> they just want. okay. Things started to come together. Uh, Eighteen fifty-eight. Oh, I see what you did there. They did, yeah. Okay. Um, Antonio Snyder Pellegrini. Uh, he was a French naturalist, and he said that, okay, I reckon maybe all of the land masses were united once, mm. and a violent separation uh, took place. I don't know what it was. And then, as the Earth is spinning, he's saying that the centrifugal force have spun the continents out. So they're spinning out like, like the gravitron or something like so that. So strong enough to spin the continents apart, but not for things to fly off. Yeah. But we spin around the Earth, so... Um, I, I don't feel in danger of being spun off. Uh, Frank Bursley Taylor, uh. he added this, suggesting the continents had moved into their um, positions by something he called Continental Creep, which would be a way better name of it. Um, Sounds like a band. He said, he said it's probably something to do with the moon, um, and the moon is pulling um, all of the... Um, all of the continents around in a weird direction oh. um, and they would plough through the – and, yeah. So – but the theory really came together with Alfred Wegener. Wegener? Wegener. Wegener. Alfred Wegener was born in Berlin on the 1st of November, 1880. He was the youngest of five children. His father, Richard Wegener, was a theologian, teacher of classical languages, uh, and Wegener, the younger, attended school at Kolnisch's Gymnasium and where he's graduated best in class. Of course he's a student. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he studied physics, meteorology, and astronomy at a whole bunch of big German universities, Heidelberg, Innsbruck, Berlin. Uh, he worked as an astronomy assistant, and then he obtained his doctorate in astronomy in 1905. Cool. Um, he did a bunch of work in observatories, but he got really excited about meteorology. So we're at 1905 now? Yeah, okay. 1905. Right. 1905. Yeah. Um, he and his brother hung out a lot together. His brother, Kurt, was two years older, and he, they both worked together doing meteorology and, and polar research. Um, so there was this, um, they were the first two to start using weather balloons uh, ah. to track the weather in the upper atmosphere. So the first UFO hoaxes. Probably. Yeah. probably. But they couldn't. Yeah, they set the, they set the world record. They for did. the longest hmm. uninterrupted flight in a, in a weather balloon. I mean. That's cool. 52.5 hours. So, yeah. I, you know, I think that's kind of a nice a nice little flight up there that you got. And they, these are going to remarkable heights? Uh, let's say yes. That's what I thought. High enough to check if you're still in the weather. Uh, that's true. And the weather does stop eventually. I think so. <laughs> I don't know. No, there's space weather. Yeah, there's if you go high enough, there's no weather. No, there's space weather, isn't there? Like solar winds and things like that. They're not really wind. I don't yeah. think that's what they were measuring. <laughs> Probably not. No, they're measuring very, very nineteen early, early twentieth century things. Like it's, it's nothing complicated. The vapors of the early twentieth. Yeah, probably measuring the ether or something like that. Nice. Now, in the same year, nineteen oh six, Wegener participated in his first of four Greenland expeditions. He became 
Um, totally addicted to doing a whole bunch of ice research, like our friend Captain Scott at the beginning. The owner. Um, the owner. Um, he said that this, the, the experience in his Greenland expeditions marked a decisive turning point in his life. So the goal of his first, um, first expedition was to study the last unknown portion of the northeastern coast of Greenland. Uh, during the expedition, uh, Wegener constructed the first meteorological station in Greenland. He used kites and tethered balloons to make meteorological measurements um, in the Arctic climatic zone. Cool. Um, and he made his first acquaintance with death in the wilderness in the ice when the expedition leader and two of his colleagues died on an exploratory trip undertaken with sled dogs. So... Cool. Spoiler: More people. More people. Some people didn't leave. More people die in the snow. In this episode. I like they're using kites what for their to work. The ponies? Uh, no, he was he was a dog sled guy. He was not. There was like, no ponies. He was not like Captain um, Captain Scott. He was more sophisticated. Or he at least trusted uh, people who had lived on the snow a little bit more. Oh. Um, well, his dogs were better trained, Rob. Yeah. No earthquakes then. Yeah. 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 Uh, they, they haven't they haven't been discovered yet. Earthquakes. I think. Uh, good point. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's weird? You know what's weird? I was I was I was when I was reading about this stuff. There was a fact about earthquakes that I had never realised, and you're gonna you're gonna tell me this later, Tanya. And I was just like, they really thought? Oh my god. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> oh, tease. Okay. They've really thought a lot of things. I'm looking forward to hear which one you heard. About. Uh, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> Uh, he went back to be a lecturer in meteorology, ast applied astronomy and cosmic physics. And, and you know, just for a second here, uh, meteorology, uh, applied astronomy and cosmic physics. We're looking at things that start from the ground and go up. You know, there's stuff in the air mm. and stuff further away from the air. So is cosmic physics ground up, not spaced down? I don't know. It sounds very spaced down to me. Um, sounds very sounds Byron like astronomy to me. Is You're or astrology. Oh. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. In 1912, he went, went back to Greenland. Uh, uh, okay, sorry, I lied before. After a stopover in Iceland to purchase and test ponies as pack animals. Oh, there we go. Mm. The expedition arrived in Denmark, Shaven. Uh, even before the trip to the inland ice began, the expedition was almost annihilated by a calving glacier. Uh, the expedition leader. How slow were they moving? You're going up close to Look it. out, here it comes. <laughs> what year is it? Uh, 1912. Isn't that the same year that Titanic sank? Mm. Like the glaciers were like... Same glacier. News. Good time for it. Same yeah. glacier. Yeah. Uh, the expedition leader didn't die this time but broke his leg when he fell into a glacier crevasse and spent months recovering in a sickbed. Sure. Um, and this time, uh, Wegener and his friend Kosh uh, broke another record. They were the first to winter on an inland ice in northeast Greenland. Awesome. Uh, during that time, they drilled a hole 25 metres deep. To live in? Oh, cool. I don't know. You're bored. You're, you're winter in the ice. You're like, it's so cold. What do you want to do? <laughs> dig a hole? <laughs> no, let's keep digging this one. <laughs> what do you do every morning? You're inside a tent. You wake up and drill a hole 25 minutes. I know how they did it. They did it with their urine. Um, probably. No, it's with an auger. It says with an auger. It's a been there for a long time. Um, yeah, exactly. This time. I do like this, this little, little story here. In summer 1913, the team crossed the inland ice, the four expedition participants covering a distance twice as long as previously had been done. Only a few kilometres from the Western Greenland settlement, the small team ran out of food while struggling to find their way through difficult glacial breakup train. But at the last moment, after the last pony and dog had been eaten, they, they were picked up at a fjord by a clergyman uh, who had just happened to be visiting a priest who, who had just happened to be visiting a remote congregation. You're not really exploring anymore <laughs> Look, when when a clergyman comes like, along to help oh out. Yeah, there's a church, but other than that, <laughs> totally exploring, desolation. totally exploring. The priest. Was obviously an explorer too. Hello, chaps. What are you doing? <laughs> Care for some mead? <laughs> it's it's the case was just on a spiritual journey, uh, right? And it just, Surely. <laughs> I just I just think that is not a glorious end to your exploring if the priest comes along and, and helps out. Like, it means I basically explored on the way over here. There are quite a few priests and churches. I, it, you, you live in a very remote part of the world. <laughs> he went home. And um, World War One happened. Uh, he was oh, an should stay away then. He was an inf infantry officer. And he was called up, yep. and he fought on the front in Belgium. But he he mm. um, he was shot twice, fairly quickly. Shot once, went back to the front, shot again, and they said, "Okay, you are declared unfit for service." He later called this oh. he later called this a period of sick leave, where he was able to complete his book. So we, the, once he got removed after the second shooting, yeah, he well he. he I'm sure there are other people that were shot twice. 
and then could still keep going because if you're shot in a not bad place, I don't know. But he was shot enough. I think being shot in Belgium's bad enough. He was he was relieved of duty, and he said, "Yeah, I've I'm got I've gone on sick leave, so I can." Yeah, now. he was like, "Thank God, I can now finally do some writing." I know, I can it's finish like, my book. Like any PhD student ever, right? It's like, well, I can finally take my sick leave. No, and it's true though. Pieces. It's all academics. Well, with this heart attack and lying in bed, I can catch up on some admin. <laughs> You, you know it. You know it. There'd be other academics. They've been shot twice in Wish Belgium. I'd been shot. And they can, they can finally catch up on their emails. <laughs> Lucky son of a bitch getting <laughs> shot twice. And getting everything done. Mm. Amazing. And so while he's convalescing, while he's uh, lying in his sick bed, he finally puts together the pieces that are the same idea that all of those people had had before. Land bridge expanding Earth puzzle folded. Not expanding Earth, not land bridges. But he again looked at the map and said, you know, these things have got to join up. They've got to join up. But he, of course, also was interested in ways that you know many of the predecessors didn't know anything about fossils. But he's starting to mm. think, okay, maybe uh, the fossil plants and animals that we're seeing in all of these places that Scott had just brought back from Antarctica, showing that all of these continents are connected, um, maybe... Maybe that might be explained by the continents moving. And so the hunt for the fossil that was split perfectly in half across two continents began. You know, you know. Exactly. <laughs> almost, almost. He found some rocks that were split perfectly in half. Oh, did he? Oh, seriously? <laughs> really? Uh, that you can he, tell? He, well, I wouldn't say he found them, but they figured eventually, you know, when, when he started talking a bit more about it, he said, oh, there's, a, there's this formation of rocks in south america and the formation of rocks in africa and if you do that <laughs> jigsaw puzzle thingy that everyone was trying to do for centuries you'd say well those rocks are actually of the same composition yeah. and and they line up perfectly and he, he he said um that it was akin to tearing a newspaper in half like lengthwise and then just joining it back together and like look now i can read them again was it that, the same that's thing. crazy so i read about the rocks and i thought okay it's just like types of rocks like you've got a whole lump of basalt here and a whole lump of basalt this is my rock knowledge um i was gonna say basalt too Bas basalt is my go-to rock <laughs> or or you know some igneouses it's uh, my, my go through <laughs> for rock too yes i don't know any others there's granite that, that, yeah, but really, as much as that, that like on a beach in, in South America, you can point to rocks that match up in South Africa or Southern Africa? I think I, I'm going to go with sure. <laughs> Not on the record here. So we've got, we got the like sentimental, we've got the ingenious, and we've got the, I don't know, I don't remember the third one. Yeah, he's. but again, so so we've got this idea. So looking at the picture, it looks like they fit together. Mm. Then you've got the fossils that are coming up in places that um, they shouldn't be. You know, it's across, across oceans. And then you've got the rocks as well. And so he, gets, he goes through and he collects a whole bunch of evidence all over the places, all over the world of different fossils, different rocks, that kind of stuff. You know, he's getting stuff from the United States to match with Scotland. Uh, he's getting stuff from South Africa, matching it with Brazil, all over the place. And he comes out with a theory. That's cool. His theory, of course as we now know, is that there was an original Ur uh, content, Ur uh, continent. Ur uh, content. Ur uh, continent. Con continent? Continent, uh, with a K. We now know um, as, as Pangaea. And we now know, of course, that is not that was not the first continent, but it was just the continent. So it's pronounced Pangaea? Pangaea. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll stick to Pangaea. <laughs> you know, for, for the sake of other people on this call, so... So, so everyone knows what the hell we're on about. So Pangia, right? <laughs> but his theory, of Pinata. course, <laughs> his theory, of course, was that the continents had once been all together mm. and that the animals and plants had intermingled across the continent, but then since then they had drifted. They had moved into the shapes that we now took. Mm. And, of course, uh, the whole geological world loved him and said, happily ever after, this is the greatest new invention <laughs> in science is that the case, Tanya? Um, no, no, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> what no. was there a scuffle? I think, I think, um, I think the, the response that he got will be um, adequately described by say using the word vitriol. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, that that was, I think, yeah. Um, well, what I liked about Wegener is that he didn't really care about it. That that was really really cool. He 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 seems to have published his theory, and he did do a couple of updates. And and firstly, of course, there was a war on. He published 1915 the first time, 
Um, yeah. And, it, and it, it was in German. Yeah, in German. Um, which was p- part of the issue, I think, because late, it was like maybe, yeah, after World after the World War, it was translated into English. Yeah. At which point he got to America, which where it really, really was not accepted. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna love hearing more. Like, so about 1922, the English language translation came out, and that's when he started doing a bit more um, PR tours and people coming around to to talk about it. Now, as I said before, most geologists at the time they could fit into a couple of different camps. There was either the fixists, and the fixists basically said, "This is the world that we've got, and it's always been this way." That's that's where you know maybe maybe there's a little bit of erosion, but nothing sure. really changes. This is what it is. And there were people. Obviously, there were the young Earth creationists that were you know six thousand years old. But there were there were um, mm. scientific geologists who accepted it was probably many millions of years old. Uh, but they still said no. This is this is the shape of the Earth. This is what it is. Okay, it was somehow magically born that way. Then there was the other camp of the contractionists or the expansionists. Two different camps, but one is the Earth is was tiny as a ball and it's kept getting bigger, and the other one is a contractionist and that makes mountains. But I'm not sure quite how. I wonder how works. big they thought it was when it started. Marble, <laughs> marble. It's just no. The other way is like the size of the sun, and it just slowly. <laughs> well, the contractionists, yeah, they're they I think they were um, interesting lot because they just uh, thought about it. They thought about the Earth as, uh, say, like one like a grape seed sort of thing. And then they said, uh, you know, when you have a a grape and then it turns into a raisin over time and it just contracts, right? So it's got these bumps and and sort of valleys in it. And so that's how they view, that's how contractionists view the earth. They said, well, it's contracting and that's what's happening. So hence we have mountains and valleys and deep sea floor and stuff like that. And that's how it happens. And they just said like, that's, that's it. Do they, do they have a starting else. point? Did they start from somewhere or they say, this is, this is our explanation. We're not telling you how the grape got here. We're just telling what happens to the grapes. Oh, they, they figured it was just a molten blob at the start. I think that was a starting point, like a, a molten, yeah, something. I don't know. Um, but um, yeah, they said as it's contracting, as it's cooling down because it's cooling and it's, hence it's contracting and then the, this is what's happening, right? So that's, that's what they thought was going on. Um, Vegana was... He was just very quick to point out, now that's just a load of rubbish. Like, it can't be that because um, that would mean that, say, if you look at the surface of the Earth, he said there should be one mean level, right? So if you, if you take right. all, the, all the topography, right, so all the heights, all the lows, there should be one mean level for the surface of the Earth. Um, and when he did some research and just looked at the total surface area, he said there's actually two. There's one that is there's there's not uh, one okay. bell curve. I thank you for that, Tanya, because I actually didn't leave this in. I thought, oh, that's going to be that's going to be a super sciencey explanation, but it did show. Yeah. So that there are two sort of standard levels of uh, yeah. there's there's sea floor and continent floor. That there's two steps. Yeah, there's like like the sea, the surface level, which is at like a zero um, elevation, and oh. one that is at minus five kilometers right and and so that can't be because if that was just a contraction right then there should be a normal distribution like quite literally a gaussian distribution right of the um elevations and the lows if you want and then he showed no it's actually two distinct levels which means it's not normal it's not random right so it can't be what they're saying that's awesome so yeah regina was really really good at pointing out the flaws of the existing theories Hmm. um (laughs) <laughs> all our hypotheses, let's call them that, because they really weren't theories. Um, the, I'll, I'll let you keep going, Will. I think one of his major issues was that he didn't have a good no, he final didn't. evidence. He didn't. He, yeah. he didn't. And I yeah. will I will complete the story to... Yeah, um, yeah please do. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So I want to go through a little bit of the reaction that he got. Now, this is not all of it. Um, I, I got, can, I, can I guess one? Fuck you. I don't, no, because you absolute bastard. No, they're old school and they're they're most, okay. Damn your eyes, sir. They're, they're toffee. Yeah, yeah. Damn your damn eyes. Damn your eyes, sir, and all your family and offspring. Um, oh, no, I'm going to go with the positive first. So, yay for your uh, eyes. One of um, Australia's favourite sons of science, and there's some weird Australians in this story. It seems Julius Sumner Miller. No, it seems oh. to be a little bit Adelaide focused. Some of this, some of this stuff. Um, 
But uh, William Lawrence Bragg, now living in Cambridge at the time, um, but he'd won the Nobel Prize uh, as a 25-year-old with his dad. Um, but he was super excited. Apparently, he remembers the exact spot where he heard about it. Like, <laughs> like someone was going with a walk, for, walk with him and said, here's the theory of continental drift from Wegener. And he's like, oh my God, this is just amazing. This is where I was standing. I was so thrilled that I wrote to Wegener for an account of his theory, got it translated and presented it to the Manchester Literary and Philosophical Society. The local geologists were furious. Words cannot describe their utter scorn of anything so ridiculous as this theory. What was the first reaction? <laughs> this is the end of the world! I, I do like, though, that he is so happy that it pissed off the local geologists, which... <laughs> to be fair, look, I live near a local geologist and, and he was a cantankerous chap. <laughs> So pissing him off, A, wasn't hard, and B, was quite satisfying. No, see, we have geologists, geoscientists. We've we got to be nice. None of them are in this Zoom. All right, I'll go with some of the, some of the more negative no, ones. and none of them are easily pissed off either. <laughs> You're going to have thick skin to study rocks. Uh, <laughs> Sir William Boyd Dawkins. Um, he, the dork. The, William, William Dawkins. He said, the current theory is adequate. We don't need any more theory. This is, this is fine. And he, he went through a list of all of the smart people who like the current theory. Uh, <laughs> Helmholtz. And let me remind you, the current theory included land bridges. It did. Right? Yeah, definitely. Land bridges. Yeah. Or, or so that's totally legit. The yep. ones drawn with Sharpie. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yep. Uh, he lists, and, and, and he said, you know, uh, Lord Kelvin liked it. Hopkins liked it. Bischoff. Dusha. I don't know all of these people. But he did say, and, and Darwin liked it. And Wallace. All of those people. Uh, Got to be good. Um, it seemed that a lot of people, a lot of the geologists were pretty pissed that um, Wegener was um, not a geologist. He was an astronomer by training uh, uh, and then a meteorologist yeah. and then an explorer perhaps, but uh, maybe a geographer as close as you can get, but he didn't really do any rocks. Yeah, he was, he was an outsider, yeah. No. I guess it's a problem even today, you know. No, I've never seen it. I, I think geologists would be pretty pissed off if a meteorologist would just now just waltz in and give us a new theory on something. Uh, We'd all be like, hang on a second, look, stay in your lane, mate. It happens you know? all the time. <laughs> yeah. I, I know I know stories. Well, it wasn't that long ago that some physicists thought they'd help out uh, cancer biologists um, and explain how cancer works. That went that, fine. That, that went great. That went fine. They, they didn't get protracted and fought through the media at all. That was fine. Nothing went wrong with that. Would you like me to do that for you? <laughs> yeah, you do that. I like this. I like this. So the July 20, 1922 edition of Nature, uh, they started to go to, ta go to town on, um, on Wegener's theory. Uh, in particular, a guy called Philip Lake of the Sedgwick, Sedgwick Museum in Cambridge, who, and I, I tell you, this, the, he got his article published in Nature by, he tested Wegener's method of cutting and slashing tracing paper to fit over the continents on a globe and moving the pieces together to match the margins. <laughs> Lake, Lake found the use of wax or plast plasticine to be more satisfactory and measurements with triangular compass to be more accurate, but he reported that in every case the continents required a high degree of plasticity and distortion to be fitted together. I'll like, have you know, <laughs> I got my kid's globe and I got some tracing paper. I... I, I don't know what standards nature has today. Pretty but much I, the same. I like the idea that um, <laughs> that your method. I think they got a bit more rigorous over the years. <laughs> your method could be: I cut up an, a, a, a globe and try to yeah. stick it together. Can you imagine actually saying that out loud? I have a contention. Like, come on. <laughs> a whole lot of people said that Wegener um, was dodgy, perhaps a charlatan. There's perhaps. people that said things like he's taking liberties with our globe. Um, <laughs> And, and played a game in which there are no restrictive rules and no sharply drawn code of context. Um, except for land bridges. Except for land bridges. We've got to keep the land bridges. That's what you've got to yeah, do. Yeah, like, don't forget. Like, this is just so easy to forget. People go like, well, sure, you know, maybe maybe the current year of the time was totally legit. And it's like, it's like it had land bridges <laughs> all over the place. They're coming back. You're going to look foolish in a couple of years when they come back. Mm. So, look, the, the, the strongest line of critique was that no one, Wegener, no one else, could point to the force that was driving continents to do this. Mm. Uh, like a lot, of, a lot of the serious geologists who weren't lovers necessarily of land bridges, they might be, but they never found this theory, the, the, the force that would actually drive it. And so there's this little story of, of David Attenborough who – when he went to university in the 1940s. And I love that, you know, this is a story, a, David Attenborough is quite an elderly gent now, but um, he went to university in the second half of the 1940s, recounted um, one of his lecturers 
And he said to his lecturer, why, why, are they, why aren't you telling us about continental drift? And I was told sneeringly that if I could prove there was a force that could move continents, then he might think about it. The idea was moonshine. So, <laughs> You, sir, will amount to nothing. Yeah, so it just yeah. seemed it just seemed the whole community was vitriolic and just ignored it. There were some that some that liked it, but realistically, most geologists said this is ridiculous. Landbridges is much better. Look, people treat Pete Evans yeah. the same way with his COVID cures, you know, and and he'll be proven right eventually. We know that. We'll Trish. do a show on that. <laughs> I want to hear Tanya. Um, well, I think it's maybe what we didn't mention here is that they're going to actually provide quite a lot of evidence for. Well, I'll call it plate tectonics because his continental drift was a, a hypothesis at the time that he couldn't really prove, but he did have a lot of a lot of evidence from his field of expertise, which is meteorology, right? And this is partially maybe what geologists and, the, and other geophysicists like. So I'm I'm a geophysicist, right? And so people in my field, you know, many years ago, just did not like what he was saying at all. Um, and paradoxically enough, it was exactly geophysics that provided the final <laughs> proof for what he was saying. And that was about 30, 40 years after he died. Yeah. But um, so he, he is a meteorologist, like, so as a little bit of a background. So he was married to a daughter of Vladimir Kepin. And this is a, a, a meteorologist, climatologist. And I don't know, so a lot of people have probably heard of the Kepin classification of the climate. That's that. Kepin. Um, and so Alfred Wegener was married to his daughter and, you know, he succeeded his father-in-law in meteorology and all yeah. that stuff. And so in that sort of research, he provided, he said, well, like, as you started with your Mesosaurus. And so he said, okay, well, we found it here and we found it there. Um, that can only have happened if these continents were joined, but it wasn't just the animals that he collected. It was like the the plant fossils, yeah. the the rock sediments, right? So he looked at, um, again, South Africa, and he said, well, I can see glacial striations here, <laughs> right? So he said South Africa was at some point the pole yeah. of our globe. And he said, well, okay, what's 90 degrees from the pole? It should be the equator. Let's have a look. What's 90 degrees from there? And then he ended up in what's today China and, you know, Eastern America, and he found coal deposits. He found sediments that pointed out to ancient deserts, right? And so all of that he combined from his knowledge of meteorology, glaciology, you know, all this other stuff that he was studying that was nowhere near um, geology or nowhere near geophysics, which is what he ultimately needed to prove what he was trying to say. So he combined all of this evidence and he said, um, he was the one who also suggested, I'm not sure if he was the first one, but he was the one who, who finally incorporated the wandering of the poles. Um, so the swapping of the, of, the, of the dipole, right, of the geomagnetic dipole. Um, he said that that was the thing, right? And he said, well, this is how I know. Here's your rocks, here's your plants, here's your everything. Yeah. He put it all in a jumble and he said, it cannot be what you guys are suggesting. It cannot be um, just a static continent that moves only vertically because that was the predominant oh it only um, moved in one direction i oh, just up, yeah, and, up so and down like away the, from the, yeah the right the predominant okay. the predominant um so hypothesis at the time was you know the uh isostasy which is a real thing isostasy is just buoyancy really but what, what it really says is like the continents can only move vertically hmm. right and so they said okay this is only due to density of um different materials in the in the continents so um, anything that's lighter will float um, on anything, sorry, anything that's much denser will will sink down and anything that's lighter will float on top of that. And so they said, well, that's the only thing that can happen. They can only move up and down, right, just the vertical movement. Huh. And so the land bridges were actually explained uh... by that mechanism. They said, okay, where we cannot see them now, they must have sunk. That's it, right? But then Wegener said, well, well, that's, entirely in contradiction to what you just told me because those land bridges to exist in the first place they would have been buoyant mm. <laughs> right they they couldn't have sunk right but they, but everyone was just like sweep that under the rug <laughs> don't worry about it right that was that was the kind of approach um and so he provided a lot of evidence to say the continents were at some point together and the way that he suggested pangea like how that was connected could you know all of the evidence that he provided could only work if Pangea looked exactly how he suggested, right? Um, the people didn't like it. 
full stop, um, especially in, in America. And I think one of the reasons that predominant thinking at the time in America is that the science should be deductive. So they said you have to um, start with the evidence and come to a theory whilst, um, um, sorry, it should be the other way around. It should be a theory and then show the evidence. But the Wegener gave the evidence and then, you know, presented the theory. So, so they just did not like how yeah. he was thinking and how he was doing stuff. And they didn't like that he was essentially a meteorologist. There was a lot of spaniel lanism. I'm sure. Right? And um, so, so I think it was really extraordinary the amount of stuff that Wegener did provide. Yeah. Right. But what he really lacked, um, so is the driving force for all of that. So the way he saw it, he said, well, the continents must flood. So he said, yes, there's isostasy, sure. But if the continents can move vertically, why wouldn't they be ver- moving horizontally? What's what's stopping them? So he he imagined these continents just plowing through ocean crust, right? And so the geophysicists of the time said, well, mate, do you know how hard that is? Like, there's a lot of friction <laughs> involved. That can't be done. And there was a geophysicist, um, Jeffries or... Oh, Jeffries! I'm like co- I'm coming to Jeffries in a bit. Yeah, definitely. Oh yeah, Jeffries was a uh, Jeffries was a pain in the butt, right? But he was a smart pain in the butt. So he did a very simple calculation to show that what uh, Wegener is suggesting. So because Wegener used his astronomy, his meteorology, all this all this stuff, and he said, oh, you know, it could be this centrifugal force of the Earth that's driving this. It could be the solar tides. It could be so many different things. And Jeff is just in a, on a very, like, you know, sort of napkin, you know, equations show that that can't be because if that was the case, then the Earth would either stop, like if the rotation of the Earth is what's driving the continents, the Earth would stop within a year, right? And he said, well, clearly that's not happening, so it can't be true, right? So Jeffries was a smart bastard who said, well, this, this can't happen. I think but the then thing he just rejected everything else that Wegener said. I think that's the thing. It, it's it's a legitimate critique. Like Wegener did not yeah. did not have um, an understanding of what the forces would be, but that doesn't mean yeah. that we need to reject a theory. Yeah, shut up, meteorologist. Because there's a gap. Yeah, that's not a huge. <laughs> yeah, so all the other evidence that he's presented was just duly ignored, right? Everyone was like, "Well, no, that can't be. That's just some magic that you're talking about, right? Land bridges are the go." Well, look at the but upside. We're, we're moving back that way. The, the political forces of the uh, Western world, at least, are pushing us back in that direction. So we, we know what to do again. In 1929, Wegener embarked on his third and fourth trip. He did a short trip and then a bigger trip uh, to Greenland, which uh, he tested an innovative um, propeller-driven snowmobile, uh, which it just, oh, hell yeah. it, it, just looks, it just looks really cool. Um, it kind of looks like oh, a, sort of a hovercraft, a '60s combi hovercraft type thing, but it's 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 intensely '30s. It just looks like fun. That is cool. Um, on the 24th of September, although the route markers were by now largely buried under snow, Wegener set out with 13 Greenlanders and his meteorologist Fritz Lowe to supply a camp in the middle of the ice by dog sled. Hmm. During the journey, the temperature reached minus 60 uh, below. Uh, and, centigrade? Yes, yes. And Damn. And Lowe's toes, Lowe's toes, became so frostbitten they had to be amputated with a penknife without anesthetic. <laughs> Twel- it was cold tw- enough, he wouldn't have felt it, right? No, he wouldn't have done. They, they, are, they are solid at that point. Snap them off with a hammer, wouldn't you? Just I'll, shatter them off. I love this point. Twelve of the Greenlanders returned to the West Camp. <laughs> like, screw this. <laughs> yeah. Screw this. You guys are idiots. <laughs> he lost his toes. Bye-bye. Uh, on the 19th of October, Wegener and two other members of the expedition successfully reached the camp. Uh, it's called Ice Mitt, um, so in the middle of the ice. And they resupplied the camping scientists, but unfortunately there wasn't enough food for them to stay there as well. Oh, eat the toast. So Wegener and his mate Rasmus Willemsen took two dog sleds and made for the West Camp. They took no food for the dogs and decided what they would do is is go and eat the dogs one by one, um, eating them and feeding the rest until they could run only one sled. Uh, Willemsen rode the sled and Wegener had to use skis, but they never reached the camp. It appears that the heavy smoker Wegener, um, and there's awesome photos of him smoking these German pipes that just look... <laughs> Two at a time? Uh, not quite, not quite, <laughs> but he looks he looks very polar explorer guy with this great pipe. Very dashing chaps. Um, dashing chap. Uh, yeah, he was just two weeks short of his 50th birthday. Oh. Um, died of exertion in the middle of the Greenland ice. Uh, Rasmus Willemsen, his companion, buried Wegener with uh, great care, marking the body with the skis. Um, 
Willemsen returned, continued the journey, but he was never seen again. Six months later, Kurt Wegener uh, discovered his brother's grave halfway between Ice Mitt and the West Camp. They built a pyramid-shaped mausoleum in ice and snow, and Wegener's body was laid to rest. And he made the front page of the New York Times, Wegener's body found in the Greenland waste, died peacefully, buried under furs by native. Died peacefully. <laughs> you don't know that. I love that. He, he worshipped it. He, he welcomed it. The evidence that Wegener needed never came in his life. Right. Uh, it came substantially later, 30 years later, really, uh, after the Second World War. And it's really, it's really weirdly such a Cold War story because the things that needed to piece the evidence together are things that only really came about potentially because of the Cold War. Because of spies. Well, okay, no, there's, there's some scientific equipment, but... Um, but it's submarines. Spying on the ocean floor. Yeah, we're spying on the ocean floor. So that's the first one. Uh, spying on the ocean floor with submarines. They, uh, uh, the Americans, Americans decided that, hang on, we need to actually map the ocean floor. A, so we can see where the Soviets are hiding. Um, and B, and, so that we can start hiding ourselves. And C, so we can see where the Soviets are hiding. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and and it's it's weird. Uh, all of the all of the seafloor maps at the time were classified because it was a it was a total secret. They didn't sure. want, didn't want the Soviets to get it. But it's 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 mind blowing to think that um, they obviously went from previously there is land has great features, forests and deserts and rivers and lakes and stuff like that. Mm. But the sea is just flat and monotonous, and there is no surface. There's no features worth looking at. That's that's your silt, mate. <laughs> I don't know about silt. Because <laughs> of your silt. Um, Bruce Bruce Heason and Marie Tharp, um, they did most of the legwork here to measure the depth of the ocean um, all across the seafloor. And they found an amazing system of what they called mid-ocean ridges. So mm. a gigantic uh, mountain range running through the middle of every single ocean. Well, not right in the middle, but right down the middle of the Atlantic and then up into every ocean, so going cool. all the way around the world. And they, they, it just had not been known before. Um, originally, um, Marie Tharp showed this idea to Bruce Heason that she worked with quite a lot, but he said, uh, that's just girl talk. I'm not quite sure why he called it girl talk. What? I, I'm not sure why, but... <laughs> that's just what a Sheila would say? Yeah, yeah, but but side story, Bruce Heason died later on this amazing uh, American nuclear research sub. It's called the NR-1. It's, yeah. a, it's a submarine that's got wheels and, oh, come and, on. and it can drive on the bottom of the ocean and he died of a heart attack in there. Oh, that come on, why aren't you talking about that? <laughs> I just it sounds I, like wacky races. Oh, it totally <laughs> does. It, it, oh, it was it wonderful. was it was too slow to do anything except research. Like it, it and, and they had to tow it to places. But it could it could it could power itself, or it could drive on the ocean floor. It had right. a, it had a whole bunch of claws for grabbing things. It is the most. It's, Are you do we have a picture you, of this thing? No, I don't hear. But I think I tweeted oh, it the no. other day. So I, you're I, saying if the only thing you can do if you're really slow is research? Yes. Yes. Hey. <laughs> So mid-ocean ridges, mid-ocean ridges was the first one. And this suggested straight away, hang on, what is going on here? Is there some sort of, some sort of expansion in the plates? This is backed up by another Cold War innovation, um, seismometry. Uh, seismometry, detecting earthquakes, detecting so seismic- nuclear blast. Yes, yeah. yes, literally, literally. Like there was, there yeah. was, there was um, certainly detection of earthquakes beforehand, but it ramped up enormously in the sixties with the test ban treaty stuff like that. People were like, yeah. "Oh, we've got to be able to check if there's a nuclear blast." And so the technology went through the roof. They built a global network. Yeah. And you know, what, you know what blows me out? This, this is this is the thing I said before about earthquakes. People thought that earthquakes were totally random in distribution before. Like they just happened all over the world. And so when they started doing seismometry and they came up with a map that looked exactly like the mid-ocean ridges. It doesn't look super random. It's, it's, it's just, it just blows my mind that we know, now know of Japan as, and Italy as high earthquake zones, but they didn't really have a, an understanding of that at all. Why the hell would it be? Oh, I don't uh, know. We, we know they both share that characteristic, but we can't tell you why. But also, like, you know, the seismic network started expanding in the 1960s, yep. actually. So, so b- before that time, um, it was, you know, every every country to, to themselves, sort of, when it comes to detecting earthquakes. And, there, and obviously, every country just cared about itself. It's like, well, do we have earthquakes here? And then there was the whole nuclear monitoring thing, which was different. Mm. Um, 
But only when the seismic network expanded, it was possible to say, okay, there's earthquakes happening elsewhere as well. And and it's not just um, it's not just the, the locations of the earthquakes. What happened with the expansion of the network is that the smaller earthquakes could be detected. Yeah. Right? So so before before then, we would you know on a, on a whatever was the seismometers at the time, which wasn't a lot of them, um, you could detect really large earthquakes, yep. six and up, sevens, right? Um, but as soon as we expanded a network in the 1960s, then we started recording earthquakes down to say magnitude fives and then eventually to 4.5 and so on and so forth. And there's a lot more of those around the world. And so people started noticing, it's like, well, this is happening all the time. Right? It's amazing that, you know, it's almost like if we share data, we can we can find some sort of global big global socialist. Patterns. But you know the other thing, it's almost like earthquakes might be associated with the globe somehow. Uh, well, that not, might be because it. it's shrinking <laughs> or contracting. You know. So the final piece of evidence um, that really sealed the deal uh, is paleomagnetism. So this is I was just going to say you were you were an yeah. ability to detect in rocks. Uh, maybe sedimentary rocks, maybe igneous rocks. I'm not sure. Probably metamorphic as well. I don't That's know. That's the other one. I don't one. know anything about rocks. <laughs> Let's just say it was rocks that they were magnetised. Rocks that were magnetised, and they Those worked rocks. out that uh, obviously you can spot things in that. But the key thing was that they saw uh, the, the north and south magnetic poles swapping periodically mm-hmm. over time, and you could chart in the mid-ocean ridges that things were gradually moving apart that you could see that the mid-ocean ridges are expanding further and further, so must be pushing the continents. So it gave the seafloor spreading and finally gave a big kick to Wegener's theory. But, but, the thing that blows my mind is these concepts came together sort of in the 50s and 60s. Um, mm-hmm. First of all, there was an uh, Australian scientist, S. Warren Car- Carey, who said, look, I think this really does support the expanding Earth theory. So if you've got mid-ocean ridges, the, the earth, that's the places where the He's Earth Peter is. Peter Carey's dead. I don't know if he is or not. Oh, no, that's um, true. Uh, he, he said, look, this is, this is expanding Earth theory. And here's the thing. I, you mentioned before Sir Harold Jeffries. Um, mm. But from 1950 on, 1915, when Wegener published his theory, all the way through the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and even later, there are a bunch of people that still continue to re- reject the idea. So Harold Jeffries, he, in 1964, uh, complained about the biased propaganda in favour of continental drift. Um, he said there was overwhelming evidence uh, that, showed, um, that showed that continental drift was forbidden by the Earth's laws, which is just great. In, in 1972, 1972, so um, a lot of this evidence, uh, a, a scientist called Paul Wesson collected 74 objections to continental drift and plate tectonics in order to state that the continents have almost certainly not moved with respect to each other. 74 objections. Uh, yeah. Were, were many of them piss off? I don't know. I don't like it. I don't know, but uh, it just it just blows my I mind. Think so, Rod. Yeah. <laughs> they, they You're were, a meteorologist. Sorry, what are you, a meteorologist? But they held on to this yeah. for a long time. So, uh. I mean, yeah, there was su- there were surveys out. So in 1961, only 22% of professional geologists accepted continental drift. Uh, 15 years 71. later. 71. Uh, 61. 61. In 1961, 22% accepted mm. it. 1977, 87% accepted. So there was a big change. There, there was certainly a big change. But, you know, there were still holdouts. So <laughs> Harold Jeffries rejected the idea of, of plate tectonics, continental drift, anything like that until, 19, uh, until his death in 1989. He didn't recant. He Screw you! Uh, okay. Warren Carey, uh, Australian geologist, an awarded Australian geologist, advocated for expansion um, all the way from 1950s until his death in 2002. 2002. Uh, uh, nice. And then there's uh, Dr. James, wow. Ma- James Maxlow, uh, another Australian who has, has Tanya worked with him. I doubt it. I very much I doubt it. So. I very much doubt it because I don't know how broad of a church Geoscience Australia is, <laughs> but it would have to be quite a broad church to accept Dr. James Maxlow's theories. I don't know. This is Doctor of Divinity, and what he got was, it on what the was internet. His well, Dr. James Maxlow is uh, still holding out Earth expansionist. He believes uh-huh. he believes that the Earth is expanding, and not only that. It's expanding at an exponential rate. It's exponential. Exponential rate. It's gaining. However, would you test that? <laughs> uh, 
How would you prove it? <laughs> so he's pu- he's publishing now, and there are people out there in uh, nature. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a whole there's a whole expansionist tectonics. So plate tectonics is the the traditional theory that yeah. that uh, talks about subduction of the plate and expa- and the spreading at the mid ocean ridges. That's the most common accepted. Tanya, you can tell me here. Most commonly accepted yeah. theory by geophysicists, um, most planetary scientists. But expansionist tectonics says, yeah, we're expanding at the mid-ocean ridge, but it doesn't go anywhere. It just makes the Earth bigger and bigger. And this is this oh, is something to and, worry and when about. They, that year they had their convention next to the Flat Earthers, it was a nightmare. <laughs> That's... <laughs> well, under I, that I, theory, we will, we will eventually keep enough physical distance that we will rule out COVID at some point, right? Like, we have to. Well, it maybe, depends. Maybe. That depends on just it just bigger. keeps going further and further and further apart. You're right. You don't have to socially distance. You're geologically distance, and it'll be fine. Yeah. So, Tanya, can we confirm? Um, not to not to uh, sledge Dr. Maxlow, but uh, that's not a current theory of Geoscience Australia. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. No, I, I think, <laughs> I think we're, we're we're solidly um, sitting in the plate tectonics camp. Um, yeah, but that's because you're very old-fashioned, though. I mean, have you thought about progressing a little? No, look, we deleted our land bridges. I told you we're not talking about them anymore, so we're solidly <sighs> in our plate tectonics camp now. Is, is there any serious <laughs> contention at all that you're aware of to plate tectonics? Is there anyone who kind of, where you kind of go, ooh, shit, that could be a bit awkward? I, I love the qualifier series there. Yeah. Oh, that's important. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I honestly, I don't know if there is. I don't think so. Um, I think the evidence, the evidence was overwhelming back in in, in Vegas time, right? Yeah. Let alone now when we have seismic recordings and, and I mean, th- there's a lot of amazing things that that kind of came together in in the sixties. I, I would like to just go back, um, Will, to what you said, like you know how long it took to get this accepted. I think it was early 50s, there was a scientist or two who, who tried to publish some papers on the, the, the spreading of, on the ocean ridges, but they didn't want to. It, it, they were just, people were so scared at the mm. time to, to go ahead with this stuff. So they were, they were suggesting the spreading of the ocean ridges in the early 50s. It took like you know, another 10 years before someone finally said, well, let's put that on paper. Wow. Um, because to to accept the plate tectonics or the continental drift, what they call it at the time, was just to kill your career, <laughs> you know, at times. Wow. It was like, I wonder how it, much, it can't be done. I wonder how much there was a, a chunk of people that were making those sorts of strategic choices and just, yeah, they might have they might have accepted yeah. continental drift when they think about it, but for a whole lot of reasons they're doing other bits and they just... I don't know. The interesting thing mm. is that um, what's his name um, Arthur Holmes mm-hmm. provided an explanation, yep. a possible explanation for what Wegener was saying back in uh, I, I think don't know didn't, the thirties. The thirties, yeah. yeah. In the 30s, I think. I, I, I just got to confess, um, I was I was joking to Rod the other night when I was when I was looking through the data for this and. Um, Someone published a four-volume history of uh, the continental drift controversy, yeah. and and I was sitting there thinking. At first, I thought, "Oh my god!" But then, when I was, I was like, "It's huge! It's huge. there." It talks about so, and for us, you know, as um, people who explore sort of the cultures of science, that kind of thing, it says so much in terms of uh, how these debates happen. Is it purely evidence, or is it more about? Um, new people moving in, old people moving away, or is it people accepting things in different ways? It says so many yeah. things about a whole bunch of different things. I think I think it was a bit of bit of everything, right? It was definitely a bit of, um, you know, Wegener was just not a geologist, a geophysicist, right? And they just did not, the geophysicists did not like that. Uh, I would like to think that if, if, if someone from a completely different field would now come into my field and try to lecture me about something that I would be accepting to that, uh. I don't know if I would be, <laughs> right? I, I, I have to be honest. I don't know, right? I, I would demand a whole lot of evidence. And this is what geophysicists were doing at the time, right? They were like, well, what's the evidence? How do you explain this? And he's like, well, here's all your plants and fossils and climate and all this other shit, right? And But they were like, no, 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 but what's, 
causing this. So what, what, what Wegener was describing was the consequences of the plate tectonics, right? He didn't give the cause of it. Yeah. Um, and so geophysicists did not like that. And we, we are, geophysicists are a bunch like that. We're like, well, but what about how? You know, we were always going to, but how and why? That's always going to be the thing. Um, and so Arthur Holmes actually, yeah, in the 30s, he, he suggested what could be the driving mechanism. And he said, well, mantle, mantle convection could be a thing. You know, there's like the superheated cells and it's kind of driving continents apart and all that. And even that was ignored for a good while. Wow. And, and Arthur Holmes, um, he started the, the radiogenic dating. He was the person who was like, this is how we can determine how old something is. He was also pretty cool. He's the father of the geological time scale. Um, so, so, so he already put that in in the 30s, just shortly, I think, after Wegener died. And all of this stuff was just duly ignored. <laughs> and people were just like, we're not talking about this. This is too risky an area to talk about. And then with the, the ocean drilling program in the 1960s, with the expansion of the seismic network, um, these things kind of independently and separately came together, right, to, to finally uh, provide the, the proof, right? And then Holmes's, Holmes's suggestion was also brought in and, so, and, and he was like, well, this must be right. Um, because with the, with the spreading on the ocean ridges, they said, well, that's, that's got to be driven somehow. And they figured it is driven by, by thermal cells from the mantle. And with the magnetization that they recorded, right, that, that was observed, they said, okay, well, the rocks on either side of that spreading ridge have a particular magnetization. And the closer we are to the ridge, that's the magnetization that is the current, yeah. it's reflecting the current magnetic field of the Earth. So all the rocks, are, um, they're polarized in the same direction as the current magnetic field. Hmm. And then the further out we go from the ridge, they would find portions where that wasn't the case when they're reversed from the current magnetic field. And then they would say they would use the radiogenic dating from Holmes, right, to say, okay, well, is that point on, say, east side of the ridge and that point on the west side of the ridge, are they the same age? If they have the same magnetization, it turns out that the answer was yes. And uh, then they were like, well, okay, that must be the thing. It must yeah, be spreading yeah, yeah. from that point yeah. and recording what the magnetic field is doing. And then they said, well, the, the ridges are spreading. Right, and they were like, "Well, so that how did they kind of does him? feed back into what Vegeta was saying thirty years ago." <laughs> so, know? so how is it that this stuff got ignored for so long? There was no uh, well, so we didn't have that evidence. We, I mean, geophysicists, right? Um, I was not alive yet. Mm. Um, <laughs> was not even planned yet. So um, <laughs> there was no evidence. Right. And I think the idea that Wegener put forward was really like well and truly ahead of his time. Right. It was just the the hypotheses that they were there were just widely accepted. And I think if you if you think about any time in history when you have something that's really widely accepted, you, you need to be absolutely flooded by evidence before you change the thinking. I would say, you know, switching from the isostasy and the land bridges to the plate tectonics, <laughs> if you pardon the pun, it was a tectonic shift in thinking, <laughs> right, um, for, for people. It was, it was um, equivalent to um, accepting Copernicus, mm. right, to, to saying, okay, we're moving from the geocentric model yep. to the heliocentric model. Like it's, you know, people go like, oh, no, we need the same. It kind of is. The amount of thinking and the convincing that um, that, that that was necessary for that to happen is, is equivalent, right? It was, it was a huge shift forward. So we're back to that whole Kuhn thing, like the, the old farts have to die out for a new theory to step up <laughs> because they are too entrenched. It's too hard yes. to let go. Like I can imagine it being really challenging to say, no, the ground is the ground. That's solid yeah. to move to a, a world where you go, I oh, know it. Oh, you know how you believed for 75 years. I'm telling you, it's not. Well, you can rack off with you, the snapper. You can, uh, you can just stay away. <laughs> how very dare you? It's very hard. Very hard. It's getting easier now, though, to change your mind. Po polarizing opinions are now more accepted than ever. So I think that's going to work out fine for all those people <laughs> who have, have one of those uh, ideas right now. It's going to be fine. Talk to nature. <laughs> Seems they'll publish yeah. it. Well, maybe you get your scissors, your plasticine, and your glue. And your globe. Get, get your nature and your globe. Paper. At this point, 
thank you so much uh, to Tanya Page from yeah. Geoscience Australia. Thank um, you. I look, just, look at all the things you know. I want to say again, I want to say again, the slogan I got in my mind for, for they were men and women of science. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. I feel, I feel heartened that people maybe change their mind or maybe they don't. Eventually. Don't the Wholesome Show, me, Will Grant, Hemrod Lamberts, brought to you today by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science and the Earth. Earth Science Week. <laughs> Oh. Earth Science Week, Earth Birthday, Earth Birthday. Earth Birth. Earth Birth. Earth Birth, I like that. Thanks a lot. We'll be back next week. Thank you. Bye.